All right, well with us um, once again is Scott Carr. I don't know if you saw his other video that we had um, or his other um, Zoom talk on um, birding and today uh, Scott's going to talk about a migration of birds. So nice topic and certainly the season because I'm starting to see different different birds already. So I'm going to let you take it away, Scott. All right. So um, I'm going to pull the presentation up here in just a second. Just as uh, by way of int introduction, as Carolyn said, I am, uh, my name is Scott Carr. Uh, I purchased the Wild Birds Unlimited store, which is located on 29 North um, near the intersection of Rio Road on the opposite side of the of 29 from Fashion Square Mall. Uh, there's a little Starbucks in our center there with us. Uh, the store has been there since 2004. I had a prior career in fundraising for a large not-for-profit located in Charlottesville called the University of Virginia. Um, uh, but have uh, owned the store since, as I said, 2017. Uh, it was one of the smartest things I've ever done. I uh, love the store, love birds, and love our customers. And look forward to sharing with you a little bit about migration today. Um, as Carolyn said, I did a presentation, one presentation before, which was on sort of the basics of bird feeding, you know, how to, you know, what challenges to, how to confront challenges like squirrels, for instance which is squarely in my bailiwick. And while I know a little bit about, well, probably more than most people about migration just through uh, self-education, I'm not an ornithologist or an expert. So uh, keep that in mind and be kind with your questions. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen now. We'll get started. Um, I uh, will say that I'm happy to take questions during the presentation and also obviously after the presentation. And in particular, after the presentation, you can ask questions about, you know, anything. Um, uh, obviously migration, but if you have questions about other stuff, I'm happy to try and address those too. All right, so here we go. Now. All right, Carolyn, does this look right? Looks perfect, thanks. Okay, all right, so there's our store and I already explained who I was and am happily. All right, so uh, the presentation today is about uh, migration and we are in the, you know, the, the big, one of the big migration months, especially warblers are coming through now, which a lot of people uh, like to go out and see. They don't really come to feeders uh, so much, so they're more birds that you're gonna see uh, in trees. Ivy Creek Natural Area is a place where a lot of people go. Uh, tanagers are migrating. Uh, you know, certainly at my feeders, I don't, uh, I haven't seen a great a cat bird in a while. Um, the hummingbirds are still around, but they'll be departing later in the month. Uh, there are something like four billion birds that will fly over North America as they migrate into their wintering uh, territories, you know, Central and, in Central and South America. So, you know, simply put, you know, migration is fundamentally the movement from areas of low resources to areas of greater resources, uh, especially food and nesting sites. Carolyn, I can see everybody over here, but I can't see my entire slide. I mean, I think I, I'm, I'm missing some of the words. Is that just something I'm going to have to deal with? Yes. It, okay. We can see it all. So, um, okay. well, yeah. if, I, if I if I miss a word, I'll just get somebody to tell me what it is. <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, more than half of the birds that breed in North America are migratory. You know, obviously there are plenty that aren't. You know, cardinals stick around. Um, our goldfinches and bluebirds and the like, and the titmice and the chickadees. So uh, there are several factors that trigger a, a, you know, the, the instinct to migrate. It's hardwired uh, in, into the birds. Uh, so they believe that the primary thing that triggers migration is, a, is the, the shortening of the days, the lowering of the sun over the horizon. Um, so this triggers photoreceptors in the bird's brain, which then triggers hormonal changes to help them prepare for uh, travel. One of the things that happens with a lot of birds is shortly before migrating, they just start packing on fat. 
um, you know, quite a lot of it actually. All right. Uh -oh. Having trouble. Uh, what if you oh, just, wait. there right. you go. There. Let's see. All right. So this all leads to, you know, in the store, it is not at all uncommon to have people come in who will say, you know, I, you know, if I feed the birds, you know, are they, am I going to prevent them from leaving? Uh, and so certainly we've got some questions about that recently in regards to hummingbirds. Uh, and, you know, the answer is no. You know, like I said, the birds are really, really hardwired to leave when they, uh, when they leave. And the fact that there's food around is not going to, you know, keep them hanging around here. Um, having the food up for the birds that are migrating from Virginia, you know, the great catbird is a perfect example, is, is, you know, is a terrific idea because it helps them to put on the additional fat uh, for the long journey south. But nobody needs to worry about, you know, uh, creating dependent birds in their yard. So uh, there, and there's a German word for this that I can't pronounce, so I didn't put it in here. But there's an actual word that describes the urges that even caged birds will uh, experience during the migratory time. They start to get very restless within their cages. Uh, it, one of the things that is, I think, most remarkable about migration is just that how the birds know where to go. Um, of course, in some ways, if, if you're a, a younger bird and if you're with a, a flock, some of which are older and have made those trips before, well, then that, you know, makes it easier. But they've actually kidnapped, bird-napped uh, birds and driven them sometimes you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles away from their normal migration departure site and let them go. And by and large, they find their way back on track and make it to their, um, their wintering sites. Uh, and, and you know, the, and the birds are, are also smart. So over time, they've learned, um, you know, what pathway is going to be the one that's gonna provide them the most possibility of getting to where they're going. And a huge part of that is just related to um, food supplies. So, right, I mean, one of the things that is, you know, truly remarkable is just how far these birds travel. I mean, the, our ruby-throated hummingbird, which hopefully if you've got your feeders out, you're seeing them. Um, they migrate all the way up into uh, Canada and uh, from Central and South America, including a trip over the Gulf of Mexico, which is just extraordinary. I mean, there's no place to land for these uh, little hummingbirds. Uh, and, you know, going back to what I was touching on earlier, you know, even birds for whom is their first time migrating uh, that are not in a flock, they are uh, uh, are able to find their way to their uh, to their summer uh, sites or nesting sites as well. So the you know how birds actually manage to do this isn't completely understood, but there there's you know strong consensus that you know they're using celestial objects. Uh, largely landmarks and also the Earth's magnetic field to provide sort of a general sense of direction. Uh, most birds actually migrate at night, so that hence the reference point of the celestial objects. And, you know, that makes a ton of sense if you think about it, because, you know, if you were migrating during the day, you would be spending the time that you would normally be in ingesting calories to prepare you for flight uh, flying. It's harder to feed at night. Uh, you're more likely to be exposed to predators as well uh, in the evening hours. Also, uh, I mean, in the daylight hours. Also, frankly, it's just cooler in the evening. You know, it's all about having enough energy to get to where you're going. So eruption, this is not like Mount Vesuvius. This is actually spelled I-R-R-U-P-T-I-O-N. 
uh, that refers to conditions where um, in the, the, the points north of us, the food supplies are insufficient for the birds that migrate into that area. And so they migrate further south. So for instance, not this winter, but the winter before that, we had a massive uh, influx of uh, purple finches and pine siskins. The finches that people see around here that are purplish in color that are here all the time are actually house finches. So the purple finches are uh, bigger and um, have a, the males in particular much puffier head and much more brilliantly colored than our house finches at any rate. So we had lots and lots of uh, purple finches, lots of, lots of house finches, I mean, uh, lots of pine siskins here a couple of years ago. Uh, this year, they're saying that there's going to be a, a large number of red-breasted nuthatches. Our indigenous nuthatch here is the white-breasted. The red-breasted nuthatch, as you can imagine, is a pinkish red color on the breast area. Uh, it's significantly smaller than white-breasted nuthatches. It's also uh, considerably louder than white-breasted nuthatches. And uh, they love con uh, coniferous forests. So if you've got uh, pine trees and, and such around your house, then you're more likely to see them. Uh, they also will habitate in, in hardwoods, however. Uh, they're wonderful little birds. I don't, we don't have um, the report yet about whether we can expect uh, a finch eruption as well. So we'll, we'll see. All right, migration dangers. Uh, predators, obviously, uh, um, hence again, you know, one of the good reasons to travel at night. Uh, hawks are gonna have a hard time seeing you. Uh, the weather, you know, uh, storms can knock birds very, very far off track. Uh, and, you know, if the strongest storm enough can also, you know, kill birds that are aloft. Uh, it's interesting, you know, the, the, the real hardcore birders around Charlottesville always get excited when there's a, a hurricane that's going to drive all these shorebirds all the way this far into, uh, 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 into Virginia. You know, just sheer exhaustion. It's a really, really long trip and it's dependent on finding food. And, you know, if you have a combination of, you know, uh, weather that makes it more difficult and it's difficult to find food, I mean, just sheer exhaustion, the birds just don't make it. Uh, light. So this is actually a really uh, huge problem for birds, uh, particularly with large cities. The lights draw the birds in and cause them to become confused, exhausted, uh, and they either, you know, die from exhaustion or they hit windows. Uh, buildings again uh, and other structures you know um, like the turbines on windmills birds are killed by by those um, there is some research that I read about which I think is interesting where you know, particularly with things like I mean you can't move a skyscraper but with wind turbines you can shut down a turbine so if you know using uh, weather satellites and looking at what is happening with migration, you might be able to say, you know, within an hour of a, um, a wind field, you know, alert the operator that, you know, 30,000 birds are going to be flying over through this wind field in an hour, and then they could shut the turbines down. Habitat loss. I mean, these things all kind of go together, but look, I was thinking about this today. I mean, what if you decided to take a trip from here to California and everything was fine. And then the next time you went, there were half as many gas stations. And then the next time you went, there were, there were a quarter as many gas stations. You know, um, it just gets harder and harder. You know, if, if the places that you were used to stopping to refuel uh, and, and uh, acquire energy and calories are suddenly gone, it just makes it more difficult. So lights out, uh, this goes back to the, the light pollution question, is uh, a really a, a great program. It's the Audubon Society that has initiated it. And it's so simple. Uh, you know, during peak migratory times, cities are asked to uh, 
turn down or turn off the lights, particularly in their, their large skyscrapers. Uh, and uh, it makes a huge difference. There was a, the, the beacons of light for 9-11, right? So uh, September 11th is, is, is in peak mig migration time. The lights were causing a tremendous amount of uh, confusion with birds and also killing a whole bunch of them because they were just flying around getting exhausted or confused. So they, but they found that just turning those lights off for a half hour period made an enormous difference in enabling those birds to continue with their migration. So there's uh, quite, a, quite a number of participating cities, including you know, some of our largest, you know, many of our largest ones, which is great. Uh, I note that Richmond is not on here, um, which is unfortunate. I mean, we're not a, a huge city, but you know, I don't know that Richmond is all that smaller than Raleigh in terms of the actual city. Um, so this is something that you know, uh, could certainly help. And it's been going on for a while now. And it's easy. I mean, it's just the easiest thing in the world. And you save some money on electricity as well. So there was a study that was done by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, the American Bird uh, Conservancy, which I think is Canada, and uh, the Audubon Society that uh, showed that since 1970, uh, almost 3 billion migratory birds uh, have just simply disappeared. Um, and, you know, it's all related, a lot of it is related to things I've touched on before. Um, but there are other causes too. So habitat loss is huge. Um, that's why I said at the top. Window strikes, lights, we've talked about a little bit. Cats, you know, I love cats. I've owned cats in the past. past. They are effective predators, however. Um, the good news is that a lot of these are things that we can actually help with. So, you know, habitat loss, for instance. Do I think that the people who ultimately end up owning Fashion Square Mall are gonna tear down the mall and make a bird sanctuary? No, they're not gonna do that. I mean, and I don't think that you can unring the bell on, you know, large agriculture either. And I don't necessarily think that you, you need to. What I do think is that for any, you know, anybody who has their own little piece of the planet, if we as homeowners or renters or whomever, you know, plant native plants in the yard in addition to ornamentals, there's nothing wrong with um, uh, ornamentals, but natives as well put out water, put out food. You know, if enough individuals do that, suddenly, you know, I don't know if you've been to Italy, but you look at the mosaics at like a, in Italy, and it's a bunch of little tiny tiles. But if you get enough tiles together, well, then you've got something that creates a picture. Um, window strikes, you know, as I said, lights out with the big buildings helps with help with that. We certainly have products in our store that can help with some window strikes. Um, and then if you have like, houses with really, really big windows. There are other applications that are very attractive that can help with that. Uh, you know, at the SPCA, I'm not the SPCA, but the, the YMCA uh, has a big issue with window strikes. I don't really, at least they did. I don't know, um, you know, what, what they've chosen to do about it. Uh, lights we talked about in there, of course. Cats, I mean, you know, if you can put a bell on a cat, I mean, it's ideal if it can be an indoor cat. If not, put a bell on it. There are these fabulous things, though, called catios. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but if you go to YouTube and just search for catio, C-A-T-I-O, um, there are just these amazing structures that people have built um, so that their cats can be outside, right, but not roaming, which is probably safer for the cats as well. So uh, this is just the little poster here, you know, make your windows safer, keep your cats indoors if you can, native plants, you know, be careful about pesticides. You know, you see those bluebirds um, diving into your yard to eat bugs. Well, if there's a lot of pesticides on there, they're getting some of that potentially. Uh, shade and things like palm oil. Palm oil is a big problem. Um, in terms of just the amount of land it's taking up and uh, it doesn't create a particularly great environment for the birds. 
uh, and then citizen science, like counting, you know, helping um, to count birds to measure exactly what's going on. So tracking migration. Uh, as I said previously, citizen scientists, um, you know, are a huge, huge part of this. Uh, a, a big one is on Cape May in uh, New Jersey, uh, but another big one is uh, Kip Top, Kip Top Piki, I think is how you say that, uh, on the Eastern shore. And then right in our backyard, you know, the Hawk Watch is coming up. Um, and that is a huge thing, you know, thousands of hawks migrate it, it, through that corridor. And if you're there on the right day, you can see these just enormous kettles, they're called kettles of these hawks uh, and, and eagles, other raptors as well. Uh, they're putting GPS chips on birds to uh, track them and see uh, what they're, you know, how they're behaving in flight as well. In fact, they, they, it wasn't, a, I guess, a GPS chip with a combination movement chip that they put on a bird, on um, these birds, and they found that, um, you know, birds, it's, it's long been known, like some other animals can shut down one half of their brain, right, so that they can be alert, but also asleep. But this study found that some of these birds that are on these very, very long migrations, I think it was a turn, uh, actually fell fully asleep while in flight and would fly asleep in flight. And they could tell by the angle of the head. So this is very cool. Um, the, the, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is using uh, information from weather radar to look at bird migration. And so they're doing this not only uh, to do science and understand you know, the populations of, of birds that are migrating, but it, they also put out information about, for people who wanna go out and see the birds, hey, you know, this is, tomorrow looks like it's gonna be a really great birding day. Often that happens when cold fronts come through. You know, I think that the birds like to get on the, it's easier to fly in on those cold fronts. Um, but I'll show you on this next slide here. So this is what a map looks like. This is from October uh, 19th of last year, but you can get these, I think, pretty much for any day. And it gives you the legend over there on the right. I mean, obviously this is not a big day for us, but it was a huge day for Texas and the Midwest and South. Um, we had a big day, I guess, October 4th. There were a lot of birds coming through. So if you're thinking about going out with your binoculars to try to look for birds, this is just a tremendous uh, resource. And again, at BirdCast Info is where you can go and learn more about it. All right, so here's just a few things that you know blew me away about some of our, uh, these are, Two of these are not birds that migrate here, but they're incredible. So the Arctic tern breeds in the Arctic and summers in the Antarctic. So every year, it basically circumnavigates the globe. I mean, it goes back and forth on the same path, but that's how far it's traveling every single year. So 50,000 miles. And there's your Arctic tern. Uh, so bar-headed geese, have been seen flying at heights of 23,000 feet. Now, all birds fly you know, at a higher altitude when they're migrating. And you know, they think that you know, it probably has to do with uh, wind currents. And also it's cooler up there, right? Um, but 23,000 feet is just a few thousand feet lower than the peak of Mount Everest. There are your bar-headed geese. I think they're beautiful, beautiful um, birds. I believe they're Asian, Southeast Asian. So now the Rufus hummingbird uh, breeds in Alaska and winters in Central America. So, you know, it's not only crossing the continent, it's like crossing the continent on a diagonal uh, up into Alaska. And it's about three inches long. So it, um, uh, and that, this is one that actually um, we, we sometimes see here in the United States, uh, in Charlottesville. So it, because of its migratory pattern, oftentimes if you're gonna see one, it'll be late in the fall. So I actually leave my hummingbird feeder up 
into November. I've never had one. It's kind of like the Orioles. I always put up the Oriole feeder, hoping to see an Oriole. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm going to keep doing it. And, I, and it's easy enough, you know, to keep a, a hummingbird feeder up into November because it's not hot, so you don't have to change the nectar quite as often. Um, and I keep hoping to see one because they do show up every single year. I have two to three customers who end up with a Rufus hummingbird. And uh, that's why it was a beautiful, beautiful little copper colored bird uh, and, you know, a very aggressive hummingbird as well. All right, so just go through a few of our summer migratory residents that are departing if they have not already departed. That is the aforementioned uh, gray catbird. Uh, the ruby-throated hummingbird. Even though we get some rufous hummingbirds here, you know, it's very rare. Uh, the only one that breeds here is the, uh, the ruby-throated hummingbird. So if you see one, it's almost certainly that. Uh, the brown thrasher. Uh, beautiful, beautiful bird, predominantly ground feeder. Doesn't go to feeders too often. Uh, loves a bird bat though. That is a wood thrush. Uh, I can't, I am not sure if I've ever seen a, a wood thrush. I've seen a couple hermit thrushes here at my house, uh, but I hear the wood thrush. They have this absolutely gorgeous fluting call. I mean, when I hear them in the spring, that's when I know spring is really coming. Um, I haven't heard them in a while, so I assume that they've, they've started their journey south. Uh, Chipping Sparrow has that beautiful copper color on the top of its head. That is a Phoebe, which is a species of flycatcher. Phoebes are notorious for nesting in absolutely anywhere. Tops of fans, you know, grills, all over the place. They are very opportun you know, in lighting fixtures, very opportun opportunistic nesters. Purple Martins, um, the largest of the swallows, and uh, absolutely gorgeous bird. Um, Need specialized how you know we have there are lots of people who put up the Martin houses and Martin gourds. It's a pretty involved hobby, but they are really a spectacular. All right, so let's get on to some of our winter residents. This is a white throated sparrow. Uh, also has an incredibly I'm not going to do the calls because I'm terrible at it and it's not going to help anybody, but you can look them up. Uh, the the uh, white throated sparrow has a very distinctive call. One of the First ones that I hear uh, later in the fall. Larger ground feeders, uh, and you'll see them in large numbers. Some of them have that yellow patch that you see above the beak, and with others, it's just white. Uh, and that, that doesn't delineate between males and females. It's just genetic variation within the population of the uh, sparrows. Uh, that is a dark-eyed junco, also a ground feeder. Um, which you'll see, uh, you can see in, in fairly significant numbers. That is a yellow rumped warbler. It's, I, I'm pretty sure it's the only warbler that winters here. Uh, all the others travel further south into South America. But uh, this is unlike a lot of warblers, the yellow rumped warbler will go to feeders uh, and uh, like suet in particular. This is one of my favorite little birds. This is a ruby crowned kinglet. Uh, it is smaller than a goldfinch, has a really big eye. Uh, that's one of the ways that you can tell. And then it's got that ruby tuft. Now, most of the time you won't see that tuft pointed up. It just looks kind of like a little red dot on the top of the head. Um, but, um, you know, I always look forward to them. I don't always get one at my feeder, but I had one a couple of years ago, stuck around pretty much all winter, which was a lot of fun. So this is a bird that doesn't stay here, but I put the picture in because uh, of all the migratory birds that come through here, uh, we hear more about people seeing the rose-breasted grosbeak. Uh, that's the male. The female looks like a enormous um, female house finch, but with a stripe over each eye. Just a really, the first time you see the bird, it's just it's so dramatic. I mean, that the coloring on the, the breast could not be more red. And so, uh, you know, they readily come to feeders. They love sunflower seeds. And so uh, hopefully you'll see some as they travel south. You know, I've, I'll have them hanging around in my yard for a couple days, you know, sometimes a week, 
and then and then they're on their way. All right, just a few quick points about uh, you know this is not so much about migration as it is about you know what happens to those migrating birds when they get here and we have like super cold days or you know some of these like chickadee they are wildly dispersed way way further north than here i mean how on earth does do these birds survive in the, in the cold weather so i just got a, one or two slides on this that is a chickadee uh, which is about three times the size as it normally would be because it has puffed up its feathers to create a you know a, an insulated barrier between its skin and the cold air all right, so as I just said, so there's a reason why down bedding is so popular. You know, if you've got a down comforter, it's nice and warm. And so, you know, bird feathers are incredibly effective insulins and they will, a lot of them will pop up like that chickadee. I mean, the chickadee is kind of the most dramatic, but you know, I at one time had some customers come in, they were new customers, it was winter time. And they said, you know, we really love, your bird food and our birds really love the bird food, but we've noticed that uh, some of our birds seem to be getting fat. And I mean, I thought it was, I was very flattered by that. And I explained to them, they were talking in particular about bluebirds. And I said, well, you know, they're just puffing up their feathers, but uh, the food is great. So um, their strength in numbers. So birds will roost together uh, to share body warmth. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, especially when you think about birds, um, like, um, oh, I, in fact, I think kinglets, for instance, they're not cavity nesters, right? And so if you're not a cavity nester, you know, being able to clump up into uh, numbers and share warmth is, uh, is huge. Uh, so the birds are also able to regulate their temperatures in interesting ways. So for instance, they will keep their feet at a much colder temperature than their core, right? So that helps to conserve energy and conserve heat and they're keeping the heat in the most important part of the body. At the same time, their vascul vasculature is such that, you know, the, the, the warm air that is, I mean, the warm blood that is heading down into the feet passes close to the cold blood that is returning from the feet so that by the time it gets back up into the core, it's pretty much as warm as it was when it left. Uh, and they'll tuck, you know, obviously they'll tuck their head and their feet in. To, uh, well, you know, one foot at a time, obviously, but they'll, but um, that's another way that they keep themselves warm. Um, birds, some birds are able to slow their metabolism down. Hummingbirds are the most famous for this. They can pretty much go into a torpor. Um, most birds don't slow their metabolism down that much because it's much harder to uh, wake up, basically, and the birds are more vulnerable. But um, chickadees, again, you know, they will slow their metabolism down dramatically, drop their body temperature dramatically so that they're not losing heat. Eating. You know, I mean, in the wintertime, it's really about calories in and calories out. How many calories can I get into my system with expending the least amount of energy? Um, you know, which is one of the re reasons why bird feeders are much more active in the cold winter months than they are right now, for instance. If you're a bird, now is the salad days to be a bird because there's abundant natural food and many of the high uh, energy activities are done. You know, mating, building nests, feeding chicks, those kinds of things have sort of completed. And it's not cold, so you're not burning calories to shiver uh, to stay warm at night. Uh, so, but in the wintertime, those things are all very different, obviously, in terms of uh, uh, the availability of food and just, you know, got to burn calories to stay warm. Uh, so there are a number of birds that cache food. Blue jays are probably around here the most famous for this. You know, they will cache in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different places. And remember, um, chickadees and titmice do the same thing. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was a chickadee that they studied where they saw that the portion of the brain that is responsible for memory 
uh, got, gets bigger as winter approaches. And, and they suspect that that's in part so that the, um, to, help the, to help the birds remember where they're caching their food. Uh, chickadees and titmice, you know, they, they all cache food like under bark in all different kinds of places. Just a handful of slides on how you can help. I mean, not surprisingly, feeding bird food is a great thing to do in the wintertime. Uh, suet is very popular. It's um, because it's super, super high fat. I mean, suet is rendered beef fat that has other ingredients like nuts added to it, sometimes mealworms, things like that. You know, people forget that birds need water in the wintertime as well, and they need water during migration. You know, so we have heated bird baths, which are a great option for lots of people. I've probably got, I've got four or five bird baths. You know, I go out with buckets of hot water every morning when it's, you know, when it's frozen overnight. We don't have too many days like that, but we have enough. And, you know, the birds won't necessarily get in there and splash like this bluebird is doing, but they'll certainly get on the edge of it to drink. And then when the temperature is, you know, if you get up to 45, 50 degrees, then they will go in there and bathe. Uh, but, you know, you, you need to be able to drink all year long. I remember a few years ago, we had a polar vortex that froze us for, I don't know, two weeks. I mean, water was frozen everywhere. And they're not real good at using their beaks to break it apart. Boxes, that's a, a baby barred owl. Um, so boxes are a great idea. Um, and so I put this one on there because the barred owl is so cute. This is a, a typical roosting box. It's designed differently than a nesting box. So, you know, nesting boxes, the hole is at the top. Uh, there aren't, you'll see there's dowels inside of this box. There are no dowels uh, in, a, in a nesting box. So this one is designed, the hole's at the bottom because heat rises. And so um, it would uh, help keep the box warmer. The dow excuse me, the dowels are in there so, so that multiple birds can get in there at one time. Um, these boxes are also uh, not, vent not vented in the same way that uh, summer nesting boxes are. And you know, in summertime, you need good venting so it doesn't get too hot. With roosting boxes, you need good seals so that it doesn't get too cold. And that's it. That question mark means, does anybody have any questions? And again, you know, I'm happy to try and answer questions about migration, uh, but anything else about birds is I'm, I'm happy to address as well. Hey, Scott, you want to stop sharing your screen so we can oh, see everybody? Yes. And I see Estelle. Do you have a question, Estelle? Actually, I do. Yeah. Um, I put up a bird bath recently, but as far as I can tell, no birds have come to it. And I, I'm wondering if the location is, is a problem because it's sort of tucked against two walls in a protected area. And it's right near the bird feeder, but I don't think the birds have gone on it. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah. So if you can, I would get it away from the feeders somewhat. Oh, okay. Uh, you, you know, one thing I think sort of just to set the context, when a bird takes a bath, it's vulnerable. So it's great if a bath can be near some place where after the bird is done, it can fly and go and preen and, you know, take care of its feathers. So mine are all close to trees or bushes. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, if you have two walls there um, as well, then those birds are probably viewing those as two less escape routes. Yeah. So I would put it into a more open area, and if you can get it closer to some trees. Very good. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? I've, yep. In, in Kentucky, uh, where we live, recently seen thousands upon thousands of blackbirds uh, they don't you don't see them close they they fly in rhythmic waves it's really pretty to watch oh, yeah. and then they stop and they roost on power lines and the power mm -hmm. lines are three tiered and we have we have counted them they will they will uh dense pack close together 
And we have seen them uh, as long as a quarter of a mile long uh, mm -hmm. in, th in th uh, three tiers. And, and, you know, we don't see them again after that. Are, are those migrating birds or any idea what they might be? My best guess, especially based on that uh, flying behavior, and I know and there, there's, I've seen that before. It's really just sort of extraordinary to watch these hundreds or thousands of birds all moving in unison. Uh, in these incredible patterns, I, I, I'm, they're probably starlings. Would be my guess. Okay. Okay. You know, the, the European starling is widely distributed across the United States. They will amass in large numbers, especially um, when they're in the fields looking for food. And and that flying behavior is also something that you will see in starlings. So, because we live across a heavily we live across the street from a heavily wooded area. So I, I was thinking that they're they're kind of maybe taking a break from migration, and 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 then feeding in that heavily uh, wooded area until they take off again. It's, it's I, I suppose it's possible. I don't know what bird it would be if it was migrating. You know I I, I feel pretty confident that it's the, that they're European starlings. Although, you know, uh, that's not definitive. You, uh, the um, purple martins. Uh, you know, certainly when they, they are, they are uh, congregate living birds. So they live in houses with multiple chambers. Uh, when they're in South America in particular, they will, they will gather in the thousands in one place. In fact, it's actually an issue with uh, public parks because they'll just gather in the south and thousands in, in these cities, in these public parks. And you can imagine the amount of poop that that results in. Uh, so I suppose that's possible. I am to be honest, not super familiar with the migratory behavior of the purple martin, uh, but that, you know, that acrobatic flying, it, you know, it certainly sounds like starlings to me. I mean, I would, um, if you've got a pair of binoculars, I would try and get a closer look. I mean, the starlings are very distinctive. They're, they look very black from a distance, but the males, if you get a closer look at them, have this pretty iridescence to them. Um, that, you know, if they were, are they decent sized birds? Uh, yeah, they're kind of medium sized. It's, yeah. it's just extraordinary. They're by the thousands and thousands of them. And they're like, you know, like waves of them that fly back and forth and back yep. and forth and back and forth. And yeah. all of a sudden they seem to get tired and they light on the power lines for yeah. a quarter of a mile. And I would go to YouTube and type in, you know, European Starling flight and you'll and there's a lot of videos because it's such a dramatic thing um and you know not to say that they're the only bird that does that but um you know that might it might look familiar what about large geese do they migrate so <laughs> so some geese do migrate and i you know i i knew somebody was going to ask me this question because i saw some geese the other day <laughs> you know i'm pretty sure the geese here in Strauss will just stick around Hmm. <laughs> so the, some geese are migratory, yes, um, but you know the just the regular, I guess, Canadian geese that we have around here. Uh, you know, it may be that they used to migrate, but now they're perfectly happy just sticking around. Okay. I'm pretty sure I saw some Canada geese in 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 the Bahamas. It's it's possible. And that was about I don't know six seven years ago. But I wanted to make a comment about hummingbirds. Um, I, I um, last year, a couple years ago, I had a hummingbird feeder out in my backyard, <clears throat> and um, but I replaced the where it was located. I now have just a seed feeder, uh -huh. and lo and behold, hummingbirds were coming to that seed feeder. I thought, oh my God, they remember where the feeder was. Right. And, and the amazing thing, is, well, not amazing, but sort of disappointing thing is I had moved the hummingbird feeder just a, it's about 10 feet away on the other side of the yard. It's a small, tiny yard. And it didn't go there. It just went away. But I did see another hummingbird finally go to that feeder recently. Uh, but the other ones didn't. It's so funny. I think once one finds that the others are more likely, you know, if they haven't just gone 
you know, elsewhere. But yeah, they have hummingbirds. I think, you know, they can live to be six years old. I mean, it's, but it's a, again, I mean, it's a perilous life. So that's a pretty, pretty good lifespan, you know, uh, if they can make it that far. And they have great memories about where to get food. I mean, there are, there have been some studies on hummingbirds that they actually know which flowers are the best nectar producers, right? Mm -hmm. So, the, so that's why, you know, if you're going to, I think I always, I'm a big believer in consistency when it comes to feeders. You know, if you're going to feed the hummingbirds, put that feeder up every single year because they will remember. And then, you know, if you get a, a mating pair, they'll have offspring and then those off. So over time, you know, I have customers who have 20 hummingbirds just zipping all over their property and speak in no small part because they've been consistent enough feeding them. And then also, you know, having the, the flowering plants uh, is, a, is a, a huge benefit as well. I had a question for you, Scott. Sure. Uh, why, why do the blue jays want to unload your feeder? <laughs> well, so, you know, there's, I think there are a couple of things. One is they're bigger birds. Right, so they've got more. They've got more body mass to to feed. Uh, the other behavior that I've seen in my feeders is, you know, they love peanuts. They love nuts. So, you know, I use blends with nuts in them, and I'll just see the the jays just sitting there throwing absolutely everything out onto the ground until it finds a a peanut. Uh, or I, I don't have any nuts in my my uh, feed, but they they just seem to, uh, you know, want want to when a load the feeder they come in and they're feeding everybody on the ground you know the yeah. squirrels and the doves and everybody but they just keep so so the feeder doesn't stay loaded very long but you're getting i, I assume you're getting plenty of other birds on there too yes yeah oh, that's good yeah yeah i you know the jays I mean, you, you love them or hate them. I mean, I I love them. I think that the I think they get a bit of a bad rap because they they people think they're kind of bullies, but I don't really look at it that way. I mean, they just come, they fly fast onto these feeders. They come in fast and hard, and they scare everybody else away. And then they throw some stuff on the ground. I mean, and maybe just that they're looking for the premium pieces of sunflower. You know, they have great eyesight, and so it's possible that they're searching for you know, the best pieces of sunflower that you got in that mix. That mix. Um, but, you know, in my feeders, everybody gets a turn is the kind of way that I look at it. I, I will tell you, I've, I'm doing nothing to encourage the Blue Jays to do that so that you have to buy more birdseed. Nothing <laughs> has nothing to do with me. <laughs> we have a, a question in the chat. Um, have there been hummingbirds sighted in this area in wintertime? So the, the rufous hummingbird. Now, I mean, you know, it's, it's possible that you could have uh, a ruby-throated that's here, but if it's here, it's, it, you know, it's, there's something wrong. You know, they, it, maybe it's migratory instinct, there's something wrong there, uh, or it was injured and it is badly delayed in taking off for migration. But um, as I said, you know, the, the rufous hummingbird has been spotted here in October and November. And I think there was one that was here into December, um, you know, just stuck around. But very, very rare. It's very unusual, but I'm going to keep trying to get one here. It's just a matter of, it's, it's purely a matter of luck. So, yes, but rarely. Another question in the chat. Can you discuss the mixed seed types you have and what birds each type tends to attract in central Virginia? Sure. And I, and I will also just say that that question was not a plant. Uh, I'm delighted to have it though. So, you know, all of our bird food starts with black oil sunflower seed because that is the seed that um, most birds eat um, and, you know, eat happily. So we always start with black oil sunflower seed. Uh, I personally like a blend that's got the black oil sunflower seed and at least peanuts in it. And then also some sunflower seed that's been re removed from the shell, hulled sunflower seed. Um, peanuts are loved by, you know, your, again, your jays, but also your titmice, your woodpeckers, 
your nut hatches, chickadees, and they're a tremendous source of fat as well. Uh, they, they pack more of a punch than a, uh, than a sunflower seed. And then the, I like seeds that are out of the shell because your smaller birds, like your goldfinches in particular, um, and, and bluebirds just have an easier time uh, eating sunflower seeds in particular that have been removed from the shell. So I've got blends that are, you know, have mostly seeds in the shell and then some of the seeds have been removed. And then I also have blends where there are no shells on the seeds at all. We call them no mess blends. And they're great um, because you don't have shells dropping onto vegetation damaging that or clean up, you know, a lot of people in sort of dense living environments like the, the no mess blends. Um, and then the final part of the question, you know, everything that we sell is designed to attract the largest number of songbirds to a feeder. I think that, you know, for me again, with the peanuts, you've got your woodpeckers, your nut hatches, and you're um, covered with the hulled seeds, you got your smaller birds, and then black oil sunflower seed, you know, everybody loves it. And another seed that people forget about is called safflower, which is related to sunflower seed. Um, it is, uh, the, the uh, cardinals and the house finches in particular are crazy for it. Uh, squirrels don't like it, and the starlings and other blackbirds tend not to like it either. So it's a nice seed if you're, if you're getting overrun by birds that you don't want. I hope that answers that question. I feel like I, I rambled a little bit. I have one question too. Um, okay. So suet, beef mm -hmm. fat, mm -hmm. birds don't eat beef. Have there been any studies done, you know, on does it affect them, does it not? I don't know if there have been any sort of scientific, you know, double blind studies done on, you know, birds and suet. I mean, you're right, birds don't eat beef, but plenty of birds do eat, um, you know, insects, uh, um, you know, carrion, things like that. So uh, I think that probably the big, the, I think probably the most evidence just has to do with what you don't see. I mean, the birds go to it. Birds, you know, would, I think, ultimately steer clear of the things that are going to be harmful to them. And certainly, I mean, I don't see any sick birds. There's been no reports, to my knowledge, of sick birds related to, to suet. And it's been People have been feeding it for decades. I mean, making them, making it themselves, even you know, mm -hmm. people doing their own suet. So, great. Estelle, did you have another question? Uh, come? Yeah, I was just curious about wh why not, why you don't want the bird. The two questions about the bird bass. Why you don't want it near the feeder? Is the first question. So there. Couple of reasons. From my perspective, one is just practical. If it's too close to a feeder, you, do, you get like poop and like detritus from the feeder into it, and that's just a pain in the neck, right? So that's that's has to do with maintenance. Um, the second is again just the, the amount of activity that can be going on around a feeder at any given time. Uh, I suspect could make it less appealing for a bird to go in a bath that's very close to it. Because, you, you know, again, you know, the birds go in there and, and they're vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And the second question is, I had this, uh, already had this heavy wrought iron table, small table. So I, I bought, um, you know, the clay looking bases for pots? Sure, yeah, you can use that as a bird bath. Yeah, that's, okay, good, okay. Yeah. yeah. But the thing about bird baths is keep them, keep them clean. You know, get a, get a good brush, you know, scrub it out. I mean, I refill my bird baths every day, um, but, you know, keeping them, keep them clean. And then, you know, periodically either cleaning with uh, vinegar or even a 10% bleach solution is okay. Okay, thank you. This is great. Anyone, anyone, anybody else? Any last minute questions? Comments? Somebody said, great presentation. Thank you. 
Well, thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. It, thank it, you it, very it, much. It's it's very welcome. useful. Thank you. I appreciate it. So it's a, it's a, I love doing this. It's, it's, it's a weird way to do it though. Cause you just, you, cause you're not that you don't, it's hard to under, it's hard to get a vibe from your audience to know whether you're like doing okay or just going down in flames. So. <laughs> I would, yes, Jean. Kath Welch had her hand up. Oh, yes. hey. I, I do have a quick question. Um, is there any way to keep mosquitoes from breeding in your bird baths? I guess oh, it's if you great. change your water every day, that would probably do it. No. Yeah. So uh, one of the easy ways to do it is there's a, a device called a, a, water, a water wiggler. Oh. And it's, oh gosh, I mean, you, you know, it looks a little bit like a miniature flying saucer. It's got four legs and it's got a little spinning thing that comes out that sticks out of the bottom of it that rotates. And so it basically agitates the water gently. So it creates ripples in the water and mosquitoes don't like to lay their eggs there. So that, that should help. I mean, I think there's some chemicals that we don't, but we don't do that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are also um, fountain inserts that you can get. So in general, mosquitoes don't like moving water. They like still water. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. All right. And thank you, Jean, for letting me know because I didn't see everybody on my screen. I appreciate it. You're and so I would encourage everybody to go, go to that 3 billion birds website uh, and, and just spend a little time and, and, and check it out. It's, you know, some of it's depressing, but not all of it. Uh, that's the thing about the decline in, in birds. But you know, bluebirds have done really well, in part because we've helped them. Woodpeckers are doing well. So, you know, there, there are good stories and then there are very concerning things, but we can all help. So if you do anything after the presentation, go to check out that website. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.